now using the best science to figure out how to do it. Good luck, you guys. This is going to be interesting. But I'm going to turn it over to, to Angie. You guys, thank you, panel, yeah. for your questions. I want to get let Angie. Any questions? Take over. Yes. Yes, uh, I don't even know where to start. I've got, got a question. My name is Lamar Marshall. I lived 20 years in, in the middle of a, of a national forest. I was surrounded by these timber activities that went on, and, and, and which included just before my time, spraying the forest with Agent Orange, which the Forest Service used in the old days. And I can tell you that you haven't heard half the story of this, about what they're trying to tell you. It, this is an unbalanced stuff. Uh, if anybody wants to, or any of the press wants to know what they left out, come to me and I will tell you all about Forest Service practices and the impact. Do you have a question for the panel? Uh, my question is, ask me. I remember actually back in the 90s when um, revision to the Forest Plan was going on. And and I'm going to switch to not to wildlife, but my question is about economic impact and also economic concerns. I remember huge stories about millions of dollars being spent for these roads, particularly in the mountains areas, to get to these places where the timber is going to be cut. And taxpayers were paying for that. And so, and this was a big New York Times article, I, and I, I can remember and being not happy the fact that millions of dollars these roads and maintain these roads so these timber companies can go in there take the lumber for their profit and it's taxpayers or in the meantime getting this road built. So my question is, is that still going to be the case? Are the roads going to have to be built or are they going to have to be maintained so that these timber companies can go in there and get this wood for their own profit? So the 90s is definitely a different model than what we have today. Uh, we have a lot of roads now. Um, that we cannot say that these forests are not well roaded. So when, and we average about 1,500 acres of commercial timber harvest a year. That's about 1% of the forest. So we're not talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres. We're talking a very small area. So um, if we, go into an area, and this is a public process, you know, where we talk about a proposal and get input. Um, they're sure there might be some road work that is done because you don't want to have that 30,000 foot level. And so a lot of us think of the forest in terms of our very special intimate places that don't map well at that, you know, broader scale. But certainly, um, you know, like one of our proposals is, you know, to have an area that does specifically offer places where we're going to intentionally manage for early successional habitat. Um, and that we're, at this point, we uh, put it out there, that's management area one. But that doesn't mean that that management area one is going to be nothing but that early successional habitat. It's going to be a mosaic. And also, um, we haven't yet gone through that process of looking at that management area and finding out which lands in that management area are not suitable for timber production. That still has to occur yet. We haven't even started that process yet. We've put some lines on a map to generate some great public input, which I think we're going to get to start a conversation and make sure people are giving us um, feedback about what they want to see. So that's a great example of, of feedback saying, you know, I want to make sure that in your desired conditions and standard and guides that you're actually accounting for having some areas that are specifically managed for you know, this particular resource and for you, you know, the rough grouse. And giving that to us as our feedback, this is what we're asking for at this time because it's really going to help us move forward to the next stage. Kevin, you want to respond? Yeah, I'd like to respond actually to, to Kristen. And I've done a lot of hydropower negotiations and the first thing you do in negotiations is agree to a set of facts. You have to do that facts and effects <laughs> of, of different actions before anyone can really propose anything because otherwise everyone draws back to their positions, their preconceived notions of what the effects will be, and kind of drops a bit of a, a hand grenade in the middle of negotiations. And I think Forest Service probably came out with this, this proposal with some lines on a map a little bit too soon because my, my head just starts spinning with, well, okay, but what will the effects be? What does this mean for me? What does it mean for paddlers and for, for hikers and for hunters? And there's no answer. So you have to kind of create your own answers in a factual vacuum. And that's not great for collaboration. So um, 
you know, it's a bit of constructive criticism. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, but you know, to really stimulate a lot of conversation, maybe um, keep kind of keep the lines off the map for a little while until we understand what the what the actual effects of, of these different management areas might be. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to um, speak a little bit to our dilemma um, because you know we are finding that you know folks are saying this is what we think it means and you've already decided and you know this is how we want to respond to you. Um, our dilemma is we're on a three to four year time frame. We have to move. We have to move forward. I, I don't get to say, nah, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm I'm getting from my boss, as you will, to stay on that time frame, and that means when we're going to be putting out a draft plan in um, about June. What I didn't want to go forward with is I, I didn't want to just like pop that out in June and say, here it is. I wanted to take that risk of getting some input, you know, and yes, you know, we're, we're definitely getting input and we put some lines, <laughs> on, the, put some lines on the map, but for me, um, that's part of collaboration. I'm, I'm willing to take as many hints as I need to rather than um, go back in my corner and then all of a sudden put out a cooked product that people didn't feel like they had an opportunity to influence. And so so for me, I'm, I'm, I'd rather be on that side of the ledger. And it sounds like, too, from what I've heard, too, is also, you know, conflict is not necessarily a bad thing nope. in this kind of process. It's about managing it and moving it forward. So I don't think we should all freak out that people are not on the same page. Yeah, I did. Yeah, just uh, for, for members of the press that are here, there's been a lot of press recently about opposition to these management areas. And so I wanted to let know that the, the wildlife conservation side, and just different, a different bent on it, we uh, in the wildlife field support these management and draft management areas. Uh, they're fantastic for wildlife. This is what we were looking for. It's going to promote, we feel it's going to promote that diversity that we mentioned out there. That's no surprise and, 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 because and, it's and, balanced, and, formally, and, and so succession. It's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to ensure, that's not correct, it's ensuring that our imperiled species or species that are in danger of, that, that they're in danger of losing are going to have some quality homes. Um, we like it because it keeps options open for management. Now, just because you have options doesn't mean that you, you exercise those. Yeah. And, and as Kristen mentioned, within that, within that matrix there, the management areas one and two, you're, you're not going to be able to run in there and just, just cut everything or plow stuff over. And so... Ten seconds, Gordon, then um, there's another question. We, we've got it. I think we really need to think about repairing the force that we've inherited and preparing our force for the future. Climate change, invasive species, loss of species, we don't know the future range of variation in these forests, and, and I'd hate to have some area where we're restricted with an option, and it's like 10 years later, it's like, oh, shucks, I wish we could do some management for spruce and fir, but, but somebody said we can't, and now we're going to lose spruce and fir. So anyway, it's, it's, it's not a matter of going over the top of the whole forest. It's a matter, it's a matter of keeping options open. Okay, let's get a question, Sam. Well, um, I had a couple of things I wanted to ask about. Um, one, was I wanted some clarification, and before you answer, I want to ask, the, throw the other thing out there. Uh, one is uh, you're talking about. I understand, and you can correct me that you're thinking about 70% of the lands being designated as for open use for resources. Is that I, my first question? Is that correct? That's what you're thinking? No, because we're not even at the point where we've not looked at additional that. unsuitable okay. acres. So that's and, and, it, and is mining and use of that kind of, is that involved here? I hear a lot about forests and uh, habitat, and I really get that. I understand about the various forests, I get that. But mining, is that involved here also? We haven't talked about that. Yeah, so, so that would have its own set of desired conditions. And, and is that part of this? Absolutely, land? this is public land. And unless it is specifically withdrawn from mining, it is, available but the planning process is there to say these are the areas where we think it's you know suitable use or not and if it is then we can say this is the type of um, sideboards we want to put on it so it is part of that multiple use mix that we have have to deal with but that doesn't mean that um, every area is going to be open it's going to depend on when we have an area and a management area we talk in terms of what is the desired condition and then look at all the uses. Is certain types of recreation in alignment with that? Is timber harvest in alignment with that? Is mining in alignment with that? And then 
if those answers are yeses, then we further refine that and say, if it's going to happen, it's going to have to be done this way. So if options are open, who decides? Is it the general, I mean, the people in Raleigh, are they going to be the ones to decide which options are going to use today? No, these are, are public lands that, that, that uh, they're federal lands. <laughs> I mean, I really don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, no, so the state does not have a role in that. These are federal lands. Okay. So they are governed by federal law passed by Congress. So we have to follow those laws. And then they will be um, guided by um, the forest plan, which is a decision that the forest service, forest service makes with input from all y'all. So. Okay, the last part was I heard a rumor, mm -hmm. and you can correct me, mm -hmm. that as the current little thing's been laid out, some really beloved areas are included, such as Max Patch and Art Lobe Trail and all that. Mm -hmm. So is that true, and what, what are you thinking with that? I mean, I'm thinking about recreational use not being ruined. Yeah, oh, absolutely. There are, there are yeah. a lot of special places. Again, yeah. you know, going back to yours, we were looking for input on the concepts of the different management areas themselves, you know, so, so having the different zones, you know, arrayed the way they are and described the way they are. We did not spend a lot of time trying to get all of those refinements down. So, for example, Hughes mentioned wilderness inventory. Those won't even show on the map yet because we're still finishing that mapping process. So, you know, if you're looking for those areas, they don't show on those management area maps now because we're still in the process of looking at it. Um, as I said, we're still in the process of looking at lands that aren't suitable for timber production. We're not done with that process yet. So right now everything looks like it, it's, it's in, but we have a lot more work to do to get to that point. And that's also where, if, if, if an area is small enough um, that it doesn't map very well, those are where a lot of those standards and guides and other descriptions come in because, you know, like riparian areas, we're not going to be able to literally map every stream and then show that on a map. We, we'd have a mess of snakes and not be able to see anything. Same with trails. Same with trails. But what we do is we say in the plan we have specific language and direction that um, address those special areas and how they're going to be managed. But they may, may not have their own specific map area on the map due to you know a logistical thing, or they'll be um, included in a larger management area, but they won't show up. So um, again, it's um, important to keep track of those areas you, you love and to express how you want them to be uh, managed. But what you're seeing on the map, I would say. Also, you have to look at desired conditions, you have to look at standards and guides, you have to look at those details to really understand if, if there's a special place out there, how that's going to be impacted. That map is only an unfinished first chapter of the story. Okay, let's take a question. Um, sorry, I can't see you. Around Stephen, uh, <laughs> uh, it's Kristen. Um, we've, we've heard and we've seen, and it's very obvious, um, the. Uh, this process, it's got a schedule, and the, the pressures and the stress that forest staff has been under, it's mm -hmm. pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, the worst thing that can happen is politics come into play. My question is, have you all been receiving pressure from Congress? And um, I, I think if so, that would, that would be a troubling thing to me. Mm -hmm. to, uh, the land managers should be able to do their job. And this process needs a lot more time than the very short time you all have been given. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that and, and if you know, the public has a chance to uh, you know, confer with their congressman uh, if it's a problem. Well, and, and everyone has that right at any time you know, to do that. That is not something that we ever, ever try to curtail. Um, no, I mean, there's been some uh, resolution pa resolutions passed by um, counties, um, probably directed more towards the wilderness issue. Um, but no, I, I'm not getting letters and being called in front of congressmen. Um, you know, they're very well aware that this is a, a public process and um, it has to be open. You know, we're taking the input we receive and we're be trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, taking taking those blows just because we are and um, and moving forward based on that and um, it would trouble me too you know if, if all of a sudden something went into you know a purely political arena um, but that said you know politics is people you know and so um, that conversation could could be happening with constituents and their congressmen and that's just not something we get in the middle of 
Okay, Hugh, a minute, and then we'll go to a question from Scott. Yeah, uh, I wanted to address the management area proposal uh, a bit uh, because Kristen has made the point that, you know, there's a lot of uh, the suitability analysis that needs to be done, and that, that's totally true. They need to you know, identify riparian areas, slopes that are too s steep for logging. But the important point is this proposal increases the amount of timber production land by over 160,000 acres. And uh, going back to a point that Kevin made, uh, you know, that on the table is not a helpful thing at this point. Uh, yet, it, we real, everybody, I think, realizes that this isn't a final proposal, but putting that out makes a lot of us feel that, you know, one, the proposal is extreme, and that signals us that, you know, the final dra uh, uh, the draft plan uh, or proposed plan that will come out in January is likely to be uh, extreme and unbalanced. And the draft plan that comes out in June also, because areas that should have been uh, further considered for protection, areas that are already on the potential wilderness area inventory are put into suitable management. And uh, so we feel, as Kevin expressed, that you know this bombshell in the middle of, uh, uh, of a proposal is not helpful to a collaborative process. Okay, Scott. Uh, as an average consumer of the National Forest, you know, maybe I go hiking twice a year, or I ride through on the parkway. What are the top three things I'm likely to notice once this planning is completed and implemented? Depending on where you go, you may not notice much difference at all. Truly, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, our, our active management, uh, if you use an average over the last few years, um, 1,500 acres in a one, almost 1.1 million forest, 1%, you know, unless you're covering a lot of ground, you know, you may not, you may not see anything. Um, you know, our, we're not looking to change, you know, a lot of, um, you know, getting rid of a lot of trails. We're not looking to change, um, you know, having a big swi switch in the change of how people experience their forests. For one thing, some of it, the change takes time. You know, I mean, the simple terms of, you know, growing trees does, does take time. So again, it's it, it's really where where you go, and what also doesn't change is all of what we do subsequent to the plan is part of a public process. You know, we'll we'll continue to put proposals out there and invite input and have you know ongoing collaboration with that. So if you're interested in an area, nothing should take you by surprise because you'll be able to have continued um, you know input and awareness of that. Um, but no, I mean it's it's a pretty big forest out there. Depending on where you're where you're out enjoying it, um, you may or may not notice much difference at all. Okay, we're a little bit over time, so I'm going to take two more questions. Um, and I'm, I've pointed to the folks that I've taken. So those of you who have further questions, maybe you can send them to Jack, and he'll ask them on your behalf for our reporting. So we'll go here and then here. Uh, if, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yes, you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a forester and as a grouse hunter, I fully support the proposal that you have on the table right now by expanding that area where you have all uh, tools available for not only timber management but also for the wildlife management. Uh, and I think some of the people in here are thinking that maybe the Forest Service pulled this proposal out of the sky. Uh, but based on my experience, it seems like it's based on the, the responses that you got uh, to date uh, regarding the uh, input on the plan. So is, in fact, this proposal you have on the table a response to the responses that you received to date? Yes. I mean, I've got a lot of great folks that have spent hours and hours um, looking over the thousands and thousands of comments. And one thing I have to emphasize is there is a broad diversity of opinion out there on the different issues. So we're trying to find that best mix of things. And again, um, the, the whole timber production thing, that's, a, that's something that we have to do as part of, 
part of the laws. I have to come up with a table that you know outlines the different things. But it's really, if I was worried about a place or I wanted to know what was going to go on, I would focus on those desired conditions and the standards and guides. What's actually that that more specific picture that's going to be painted on that area? Because whether timber harvest occurs or what kind of recreation occurs. Um, or whether it's preserved for a more um, backcountry experience, that's all going to be driven by those desired conditions and standards and guides. And that those management areas are more of that broad 30,000 foot level that is, um, you know, that we have, have to come up with for zoning. But it's, it's going to be a, a matrix out there, it's a work in progress. And so this is your all's opportunity to tell, continue to tell us about those areas that are special to you and provide input on some of those um, that management direction that will really help um, you know, f further narrow that picture and, re and refine what some of those broad, broad brush um, areas mean. Okay. Our last question. Yeah, I don't want to talk about something. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's oh, her. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, my concern is <clears throat> that you have adequate information to make this plan. Mm -hmm. In recreation, we've heard from Washington that you only have 17% of the trail management objectives done on the Nantahala Pisgah, and I don't know how you would be able to adequately plan when you only have 17% of the information. Mm. Well, we did complete a, a pretty intensive trail strategy where we spent a lot of time working with folks to get their input on what they wanted to see um, in, in a trail system and the different types of, types of uses. And we, we're continuing to work with a variety of trail groups. I mean, we, we couldn't get near the work done without them. We have folks from your organization, Backcountry Horsemen, um, Carolina Mountain Club. There are a lot of folks that are working with us, and they're telling us you know, what's going on out there. Um, but again, the, the plan is very high level. And that's, that's really what is, is sometimes hard to deal with when you're talking about a landscape this big, 1.1 million acres. And you're talking about being at the 30,000 foot level, you know, we're going to be talking in terms of, you know, pretty broad, broad objectives. And when it gets down to, you know, what's going on in a particular trail system, um, there's definitely more work to be done and the plan isn't going to be able to get, get all that. And so, yes, we acknowledge that there's a lot of work to be done on trails and um, it's a great, rich um, opportunity for further collaboration on that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the planning process isn't going to be able to um, a able to address all of those more site-specific issues. Thank you. Uh, but I'm glad you're very, very engaged and interested in it. We're going to take maybe one minute to give each of you a little bit of time to conclude this, and then um, I'm going to encourage all of you, those of you especially who had questions and weren't able to, we weren't able to get to them today, to send them to Jack. Um, and to continue the conversation in the series um, on carolinapublicpress.org. So, Kristen, do you want to go first, and then we'll go down the line, or would you prefer to end? <laughs> well, why don't, why don't we give you a break? Why don't right. Gordon, you go first? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, Just a minute, please. Yeah. Gold, <laughs> the, the, gold, the Golden Wing Warbler. American Woodcock, Prairie Warbler, Chestnut Sided Warbler, Rough Grouse, Black Bill Cuckoo, Yellow Bill Cuckoo. There's two cuckoos. Uh, brown Thrasher, Field Sparrows, Eastern Towhees, Yellow-Breasted Chat, Indigo Bunny, Kentucky Warblers. A lot of these are on priority list. We need early successional habitat. We need to open it for a lot of these priority species. Cerulean Warbler, uh, uh, Blue-Gray Gnatcatcher, Hooded Warbler, American Red Start, uh, Yellow-Breasted, uh, uh, Yellow-Bellied Sapsucker, Brown-Headed Nuthatch. We need to open up some of these dense forests for, for those species. Game species, Deer, Grouse, and Turkey. Low, historically low populations. We've got, you've got to help us here. The, these management areas are going to help us do these things. We're not going to cut everything down, but we're going to use these species as a guide. One last thing, uh, the comment about the bombshell to the collaborative process, in my opinion, what, I, what I've just found, found unfortunate is, is the reaction to the management areas. Press releases, media blitz, Industrial logging, massive road building, cutting and recreation areas. I hope we've heard tonight that that's, that's not what's going to happen here. That's what the plan says. No, no it's not. Yeah, that's it incorrect. That's not, that's not what's going to happen here. That's inaccurate information. So okay, Kevin. That's a bombshell. The reaction is the bombshell. Maybe it's disappointing, but everybody loves clean water, so I can't make part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, but 
you know, I, I just really like the plan to envision a, a, a future where the streams in the forest are clean and cold and the best ones are protected from development. You know, we've seen Sierra Nevada move in just downstream of the National Forest, largely because of the water that comes off the forest. Um, South Mills, North Mills could be eligible for wild and scenic and, and recognize the investment that people are making in our communities because of the National Forest and because of the environmental benefits they provide. So we're engaged in this process, um, you know, around the country because we see a lot of value in participating in forest planning. Um, certainly recommend that other folks do the same and think about your own vision for the future of the forest and really just think about the special places and special experiences that that you care about the most and make sure that the Forest Service knows about that. So when they're drawing lines on the map and they're thinking about effects, they're thinking about you and the places you love. Thank you. Uh, these broad brush strokes that uh, Kristen referred to really make a difference. They make a difference in, uh, you know, the areas that uh, create conflict, areas like Courthouse Creek, the project that was proposed uh, uh, about a year ago that led to tremendous conflict. Uh, conservation groups supported some of the good restoration in that area, but it went beyond restoration and the regeneration harvest, basically to pay for roads and, and other activities. And so these broad brush strokes really do matter because they put areas that should be off the table for conflict directly in the line of conflict. Well, I want to thank you all for being here because uh, when people stop caring about their national forests, then I really am worried because, you know, that's, Amen. you know, we have land in the West that folks are advocating to not have anymore. So uh, I am so glad to see people continue to care and be engaged. And uh, I want to continue to encourage that. And um, whatever you hear, um, I just, I really ask that, you know, look, come to our website and look, look for yourself. You know, decide what you feel are, are the facts and, and act on those. Um, participate, you know, um, be your own voice. And if you have questions, you know, we're here to continue to meet with you and, and collaborate with you. Um, we're, we wouldn't have put something out there if we wouldn't, didn't want to have feedback. So um, please, you know, continue and engage with us because this, these are your lands and um, this is your plan. So thank you. Jeff, do you want to talk just real briefly about what's coming up in the series that may address some of the questions that people Yeah, have? yeah, so we're working right now on a draft that kind of uh, looks at the nuances of the uh, uh, managing forest and advocating for wildlife. So I try and uh, uh, really clearly explain the two arguments, not that they haven't here, they've done a wonderful job of explaining. But we can go on for longer. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and I get to sit down with them for a long time, Maybe too. a couple of beers would help out. Yeah. Um, and then we'll also take a look at the economic impact of the forests in the future, which I think, Chris, it didn't come up so much, but one of the huge components is uh, advocating for rural areas that are hugely connected to the national forest. Macon County has 50% national forest in their county, so uh, it affects all of us. But those are a few of the yeah. things, and hopefully looking at water as well with Kevin and talking a little bit about that. So check us out on carolinapublicpress.org where the stories will continue. Please ask questions on those stories, continue that dialogue. If you want to send Jack questions, please do. That's a great way to impact what kind of news comes out and what, how we address that. Um, we really want to thank all of you for coming to our first Newsmakers Forum. Lots of really passionate, informed conversations. So thank you all for that time that you spent. And thank you to our panelists. And, and thank you to Carolina Press for objective journalism. That's, okay, that's a good stuff. Thank you.